You are listening to the Foreign Policy Focus Podcast. We cannot wait for the final proof. The smoking gun it could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Haven't you driven enough people from their homes over and bulldozed their villages, seized their property under law as they had no part in making now working in Libya with friends and allies, we've demonstrated what collective action can achieve in the 21st century. Now the host of the show, Kyle Inslee. This is episode 319 of the Foreign Policy Focus podcast. On today's show, I want to talk about how the U.S. war on terror has become this generational war and some of the different actors and groups that helped to perpetuate this, what seems to be endless and boundless war against terror share the show or recommend it to somebody best place to find it online is at the libertarian institute my show and the daily news roundup that i write are published there on the home page url is libertarianinstitute.org make sure you're subscribing to the show somewhere itunes stitcher youtube it should be up everywhere i cover current events on this show so i think the episodes really build upon each other and probably helps to understand things if you listen to them all Last year, if you want to donate to the show, patreon.com slash foreign policy focus. I produced some bonus content actually on Monday, did kind of an impromptu interview with former guests on the show, Kevin Darumis, who talked about China and great power rivalries. I think it's a pretty interesting show and you get access to if you donate. The first story I have to talk about today, published at The Intercept about Chelsea Manning receiving a subpoena to testify to the eastern virginia district federal grand jury now there's important information uh that comes from this subpoena the first is that it's from the same prosecutor that's alleged to hold the sealed indictment of julian assange it's not known for sure that the indictment exists however there's pretty good evidence that it does as a section of the indictment against julian assange was copy and pasted into another indictment that was made public and so i think this seems to further the the case that there's probably an indictment against julian assange especially since you know the article details what else would chelsea manning really know about uh, of that much importance the other thing that the article points out and while it's not you know within the typical scope of this show is certainly something that i'm interested in i think is very important is criminal justice reform and the abusive amount of power that federal prosecutors have, especially when they're able to use a grand jury to demand, you know, just anybody shows up and testify about what, you know, ever they ask. And if you don't, you're held in contempt of court and you could serve up to 18 months in jail. So, you know, that's a pretty serious amount of power and it could really be used to bully people into saying things that they don't want to say. Well, I certainly don't focus on that as much as the wars because I don't know if it's quite as important it is certainly an issue that you would hope the U.S. would eventually one day move in the right direction. All right, now into the, the thing I have here about generational war. On the show, I've talked about how, you know, we're coming uh, to the 18th anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks and how, you know, there's young men signing up today and enlisting that weren't even alive when this happened. And I'm sure we're soon going to be to the point where uh, they're going to be deployed to the U.S. wars overseas. I mean, in Afghanistan, it seems that even maybe in our, our best, you know, hope is that they, they follow this five-year plan and naturally withdraw from Afghanistan then. Well, you know, these certainly uh, young people will be in well into their 20s uh, by the time that war would end. And so I'm sure there would be young men born after 9-11 and the start of that war in Afghanistan that are fighting it. And so in that way, we could really start to look at it as a generational war. Another indicator of that is the United States has now put a $1 million bounty on the son of Osama bin Laden. I believe his name is Hazam bin Laden, um, but I, I'm not exactly sure how that's pronounced. He is actually married to the daughter of Mohammed Atta, who was one of the key hijackers on 9-11. And so it certainly makes for a very easy enemy to portray. You know, you don't have to do much convincing of the American people that the son and daughter of you know these terrible jihadists i mean you know there's absolutely no defense for what and you know anything that osama bin laden or Mohammed atta did i mean you know they killed massive amounts of civilians there's no reason for that at all and look what it's provoked the united states to do however you know we're now placing the bounty on their children we assume ah, you know they're they're probably scum just like their parents now i do believe that this son is the al-qaeda dedicated son and actually is a, a piece of scum like his father um and i'm sure will 
you know, look to exploit more and more the terrorist suicide bombing tactics, you know, as Al Qaeda continues on their global jihad. So other than, you know, this kind of being a marker of a general rational war, one thing I, I think is worth pointing out here is that I don't know tactically if this is a smart move. So the, you know, the best case scenario is that somebody sees this and says, ooh, a million dollars. I'm going to go turn this guy in or give up information that will lead to his arrest or, you know, just kill him or whatever. The problem with that is there's an awful lot of evidence of the United States kind of offering these kind of deals or extending a hand to groups and people in the Middle East. Uh, you know, I'm talking about translators who helped us, you know, with our occupation and wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, the truck drivers who drove the ISIS fighters out of Raqqa. And then, you know, we're stiff by the United States. Of course, the translators I'm talking about before, some of them, you know, end up being killed or, you know, have, you know, applied to move to the United States and, uh, you know, weren't given that. There's a lot of evidence of that happening. I believe the doctor who was involved in the capture of Osama bin Laden, and uh, I don't know if that's for sure the, the right story, just because there's so much propaganda around that event. But I believe there's a, a Pakistani doctor who helped the United States um, get bin Laden, and he actually served quite a bit of time in a Pakistani jail. And so just because you help out the U.S. doesn't mean that you're going to be rewarded. And so I'm sure there's a lot of people who, I don't know if this would incentivize, but if you're the younger bin Laden, he could go around and say, hey guys, see, I'm real important. The U.S. is real scared of me. And, you know, I'm sure this could be used as a recruitment tactic and also a way to help, you know, reaffirm his uh, position of leadership within the Al-Qaeda organization. The other thing that may be worthwhile, since we're looking at this as a generational war, is has the first generation of fighting this war been successful for the, you know, from the United States standpoint? I mean, the Islamic Caliphate has just been defeated, so, and, and I think this probably weighs into this a little bit too, with Baghdadi uh, becoming less and less important, Maybe the U.S. is trying to build up, you know, a new boogeyman. And like I said, I, you know, I mean, this is a easy to demonize uh, person. But there's still a huge, you know, faction of Syria that's uh, controlled by Al Qaeda. The recent reporting out of Syria is they control almost all the Idlib province now. You also have, you know, still thousands of ISIS fighters running around Iraq and Syria. You have, you know, thousands of women who joined ISIS and their children. Uh, that have Western, you know, citizenship and yet are in prisons in Syria uh, and, you know, questions about what we're going to do with those people. Uh, but looking, you know, you have Al Qaeda affiliated groups now in the late Chab Bison in the Shahel region of Africa. Um, I believe JNIM is the Al Qaeda affiliate there. Uh, there's Boko Haram. There's uh, the Islamic State affiliate. Uh, there's ISIS and Al Qaeda in Libya. There's Al-Shabaab in Somalia, there's AQAP and ISIS in Yemen, Al-Qaeda and Iraq still exist, and then you now have ISIS-K, and not the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, but the Taliban still, you know, exist and are in rising power in Afghanistan. And so if you look across the whole Middle East, I mean, the war on terror, you, you had to say in the first generation has been an absolute failure, especially when on 9-11, you just had a few hundred Al-Qaeda guys that were hiding out in the mountains in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Other than that, Al-Qaeda really wasn't anything. I mean, they got really lucky with the 9-11 attack, gained that whole plan to play out and work out uh, as tragically as it did um, from our standpoint. But, you know, they, they really weren't able to organize a whole lot. And yet, you know, you just had a giant caliphate existing in Iraq, I guess is my point there. So uh, I think looking, you know, you had to assess the first generation of this fight was definitely not a win uh, for the, the Western world, the people of the United States, our safety, um, or just in, in military strategery. Uh, certainly, the, I think the only group you could say that has really gained is the jihadists. Uh, it's been absolutely catastrophic for the, the actual people who live in the Middle East, the civilians, whether it be in Yemen, Afghanistan, or Somalia, just trying to live a life. And, you know, they're facing famine, death, food shortages, uh, being killed by American bombs is just terrible. Of course, uh, another problem has been even when the wars aren't necessarily against terrorist groups. So you think Assad, Saddam, Gaddafi, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, the, the, you know, build up towards the war with Iran. 
it's all the, you know kind of in this terrorist you know they all support help al qaeda or they're like al qaeda uh when in reality a lot of these people you know really actually uh oppose al qaeda and so you know but using that terrorist uh language in the 2001 aumf uh you know the the terror war congressional authorization for war has been used absolutely endlessly and so you know this is just another reason that the war of a generation goes on you know one important thing to note here one reason i think why you know the wars will go on forever isn't necessarily because of all the executive power but because congress has absolutely refused to do anything and there there's no demand for it and and so unless you know there's a huge interest suddenly that builds up in ending some of these wars uh congress could continue in their role of just kind of funding it as it goes along but not really developing any bigger strategy not putting any limitations on the president and therefore not accepting any responsibility, at least that's the way they look at for any of these wars. There's a great podcast that uh, a frequent guest of the show, Brian Sadie, just did on his show, Rackets. I'll link to it in the show notes page. But he interviews a veteran who actually tried to, I guess, you know, use a lawsuit to, you know, say that there's no authorization for the war in Syria. And of course, until the U.S. goes bankrupt, I mean, the money's just going to keep flowing. And, uh, you know, all the people who have any interest in the wars whatsoever, uh, like the weapons makers and the think tanks, pretty much anyone, I guess, but the troops are just going to keep profiting off the thing. And, and so there's, you know, just so many reasons that this isn't going to end, even though it's a horrific policy, both for Americans and for the people over there, uh, it just seems destined to go on. You know, one of the fears that we always say uh, when we look at Venezuela is we don't want it to turn into the next Iraq. And, and I do think that it's you know, actually something we do have to worry about. If we start intervening there, uh, we may never leave that country, just like we, we haven't left any of these Middle East wars. I do think we're maybe, I don't want to say looking at good news, because there's really uh, no great news coming out of Venezuela, but uh, good in the sense that this uh, regime change seems to have fizzled out. Um, I saw that the one of the net speed stunts they tried to pull was... Uh, Juan Gallido's return to Venezuela and will he be arrested? Uh, Maduro so far seems to have just ignored him more or less. And uh, as Moon of Alabama puts out, and I'll link to that for more analysis if you want it. Uh, basically, you know, that this whole thing is really starting to fizzle at this point. Now, the fear is that the U.S. keeps saying that all options are on the table. And so if these options that they're trying now aren't working, uh, how far can can we go? As much as it may be really the hearts in the Trump administration, not Trump himself interested in this regime change here. I I do remember back to pretty early on in the presidency, there were times where Trump uh, seemed to be talking about it, at least, you know, in the new, I think, Andrew McCabe book. Uh, He claims that Trump asked McMaster to draw up plans for that. I don't know if that actually happened. You know, it's a liar talking about people who lie. So it it could just be, you know, like a fake rumor they heard. But uh, it could be that, you know, this kind of like the Iran situation is a longstanding Trump policy that he wants to do something about the regime in that country. Talking about Saudi Arabia real quick, uh, there's a couple stories that involve Americans. One is a U.S. doctor who was apparently scooped up in the Ritz-Carlton detainment back in 2017 and is alleged to have been tortured along with some of the members of the Saudi royal family. It's a Saudi harvard trained doctor who i guess somewhere along the lines got american citizenship and is still being detained in saudi arabia and people really aren't sure why so i'm guessing there's a whole lot more to this story to explain why nobody's known about for the past couple of years however we did see this in a similar story with the uh uae and the uk where one of their citizens was detained and i guess kind of told that hey if you make a big deal out of this and you go to the media it's not going to go so well uh, you know, because the, the person did detention actually can't talk, but to their family members, it's not going to go so well for your family member. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they haven't spoken out and nobody knew about. It. And then somebody finally spoke out. And I, I believe that guy was a researcher uh, and was actually then released to the UK. So maybe they saw that or are now uh, looking for that path for this doctor. There is also a uh, apparently an, a woman with American citizenship who was married to a guy in Saudi Arabia and then got divorced, but because of laws, I guess, and not having a husband, she doesn't have the rights to, by herself, travel around the country, and has essentially been detained 
uh, by the, the Saudi repressive law against women. Now, these are two absolutely horrific humanitarian stories. No, it doesn't mean that the United States should go to war to overthrow the Saudi royal family, but it is an indication that this isn't a government that values human rights. Uh, you know, not even to talk of and speak about the crisis in Yemen and the genocide that Saudi Arabia is waging there. But, you know, these are people with American passports, uh, you know, American citizenship. Americans should care about that. And Saudi Arabia is treating them that brutally. Uh, you know, you would think that after the Jamal Khashoggi thing, maybe, uh, they would wise up a little bit and at least take it easy on people with, you know, either American citizenship or, uh, right for American news outlets. Uh, but they could still, still continue this, you know, very aggressive policy. And, you know, what should at least happen is the United States should say, well, we're definitely not selling these people who violate humanitarian rights so often any more weapons. And yet it appears now that the Pentagon has approved a nearly $1 billion uh, sale of THAAD uh, missile defense systems to Saudi Arabia. More human rights abuses from U.S. allies. Here we have Israel. A story from the New York Times says Israel may have committed crimes against humanity with their treatment of the people of Gaza during the, the 2018 Great Return March protests where people mostly innocent civilians from gaza i think almost all innocent civilians i'm not aware of any actual attempts by hamas to exploit these protests to uh in any way harm israeli soldiers but you have you know nearly i think 200 innocent people gunned down uh by the israeli snipers and the israeli military uh thousands injured including you know by live fire rounds amputations uh killings of journalists children uh you know very young children uh, clearly boys a medic was shot in the back i mean these are the stories that i've talked about over the past year uh, of what israel has done to these people in gaza who are protesting they're absolutely you know horrific conditions that they're uh, forced to live in and the fact that the word may is used here it is in its way comical uh in, in a very dark way but at the very least, you know, more attention is being played to paid to this issue. And as, you know, much as Representative Ilan Omar faces a lot of backlash and I, I think a lot of racism for her comments about Israel, um, it does seem to be that more and more of that criticism is, is acceptable. And so it really needs to be brought to attention because not the Israeli people, not the Jews, but the Israeli state and the Israeli military are committing horrible crimes against the palestinian people and worth mentioning i saw a tweet from the israel idf and i'm trying to exactly pin down what is going on here but the u.s is, was at least a test deploying thad missiles to israel and so i don't know if this means that uh, a sale is incoming and this is a prelude to that or if this is just you know a uh, Lockheed Martin gained the U.S. military to pay for a demonstration on their weapon systems for the Israelis. I saw it came in on Big American Jet and everything. All right, last on today's show, I just want to run through some things going on in Africa. Uh, you know, talking about the generational war at the start of the show, one of the places it's going to continue to spread to is the African continent, uh, mo mainly kind of the Shahel region in north. And there's a lot of instability in that region, I think. You know, from the legacy of colonialism and just naturally a lot of different tribes, a lot of different languages. So, you know, the, the perfect kind of situation, a, a lot of empty desert areas uh, that there could be strife and terrorists hanging out. And so, unfortunately, I think this is probably an area where the terror war could, could really expand to here. In Somalia, I think we've seen over 24 strikes by the United States in 2019 so far so this is a, a huge increase over the war in past years i mean this puts us on pace for well over 100 in, in 2019 and when you looked at the obama administration i think it was about a dozen a year so overall under the trump administration it's a huge escalation but this is you know potentially double the amount of strikes of last year and of course the problem is is that so many of these strikes are potentially uh cia drone strikes um and we really don't know how much is going on in somalia just the ones that the U.S. government, and I think AFRICOM is always the group that's, you know, giving the announcements. Now, the other thing is, is that they just always say they kill that number of Al-Shabaab militants and never say they kill any civilians. So I have a uh, really big question marks as to how accurate the numbers that they put out are. There's been a couple attacks by Al-Shabaab in and around the capital of Mogadishu. 
one attack was on a hotel i think killed about 30 civilians a- another attack it targeted a- i think a couple police officers and there was a few other suicide bombings around Mogadishu. I'm not sure if this is at all related to the U.S. strikes. It's certainly possible. I've often talked about how the biggest uh, terrorist attack in Africa uh, was likely a response to U.S. and Somali national forces committing war crimes. So it's not impossible that you know these attacks will occur for that region. But there's also you know this ongoing civil war there. Uh, the Somali government is not very friendly to the southern Somali region, which is uh, largely held by Al-Shabaab. Talked in the past on the show how they've arrested political leadership. So, you know, there's also reasons in Somalia for the the people to hate the government and want to carry out these attacks. In Libya, uh, General Khalif Haftar, who is, you know, once you called him the ruler of eastern Libya, has now taken a large portion of southern Libya. And so if you look at a map of Libya now, he seems to control about half, if not more, of the country, uh, minus the capital of Tripoli and uh, the you know kind of the cities in the northwestern quadrant of that country. Uh, Haftar controls a lot of it. I think there's still some uh, of the city and oil fields in southeastern Libya that aren't held. I don't think he controls uh, Libya all the way along the country's border with Chad, but has now taken control of the country's border, the southern border with Algeria. It's hard to tell how uh, he's gaining all of this territory as rapidly as some of the territorial gains have come. And I've seen no evidence uh, or stories coming out that uh, large battles are happening anywhere out here. It may be through, you know, deals with local groups, because I think a lot of these uh, regions were controlled by militias, not necessarily an opposing state. If that's the case, it does make you wonder where are Gaddafi's son and Arab parent uh, Saif al-Islam is, uh, the Russians say that he's alive and will possibly run for an election as president if Libya holds an election, and Russia also bats uh, Khalif Haftar and his forces, so it, it would seem that if he's alive, he that's probably the side he's allied with. Libya's largest open field, oil field is now controlled by the Haftar government and has reopened. I'm not sure how long it's going to take for that uh, oil field to start producing oil. I think it produces about 315,000 barrels of oil per day. As much as I'm sure a lot of that is going to be stolen by the different corrupt factions in Libya, it, it may be a source of income for the people of that country that, you know, desperately need not only stability, uh, but, you know, rebuilding. I recently uh, saw a PBS News Hour segment on uh, CERT, one of the Mediterranean cities it was actually taken by isis and the obama administration dropped like 500 bombs on that city it's still largely rubble and needs to be rebuilt as i mentioned earlier the u.s has announced a training mission for troops in burkina faso now you know this is of course done in the counterterrorism mission and everything like that but there are active rebellions against the government in burkina faso so it is concerning that even if the U.S. is training these troops for counterterrorism, it's going to be used for repression of minority groups and people and, you know, could further strife in that country. The civil war uh, continues in Mali, and there I read more and more about terrorist attacks, uh, especially JNIM uh, is the terror group in that country. But I did see that France is now carrying out airstrikes there, so I just wanted to note that. The Ebola outbreak continues in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, I think mostly in the northeast of that country. Uh, There's a lot of concern here because there's some large population cities uh, that this Ebola outbreak has really started to break into. The reason I want to talk about it on the show today is I read a report from Doctors Without Borders that after attacks on two of their treatment centers recently, they're closing operations in the country at least for a couple of weeks and looking at how to reapproach the situation. It's an interesting report, and I think it sheds a little bit of light of what the country is like there. Apparently, one of the problems is is that Ebola initially presents very similarly uh, to other illnesses that are frequent in the country, like malaria. And so people are, you know, hesitant to go to this, you know, treatment center where people who don't like look like you from, you know, speak probably other languages and have AdSense are wearing these big white, you know, decontaminant suits uh, and, you know, claiming that you you have a high chance of dying 
uh, from this disease is, is probably not something the local population is always extremely friendly to. And so they're going to look, look at, you know, doing more informational and, and kind of ground effort work to uh, figure out how to start making uh, strides here. Important note is that in the second treatment center that was attacked, uh, some patients who possibly had Ebola fled. And so, you know, that, that always, of course, increases the risk of outbreak if there's people with Ebola running around because uh, different groups showing up with rots, shooting people and setting things on fire. I will say to Doctors Without Borders credit, I thought the report was very good and, you know, put a, probably a disproportionate amount of blame on their organization, you know, saying that these are all the things that we're, we can and will do better next time around. I guess just because I read government reports all day long, I'm not too familiar with, uh, you know, that kind of level of honesty and uh, self-criticism. That outbreak has now, I think, killed about 900 people. So we are looking pretty close to the, well, I guess not, because I think that other one was a few thousand people ended up dying. But we are, you know, inching towards a thousand. And, you know, when a thousand people had died in that, uh, you know, Western Africa outbreak, you know, the media attention was crazy. I remember listening to Sean Handy and him having on a guest that said, you know, this is the plague and, you know, this is what we have to fear and worry about. We have to do everything possible to stop this thing from spreading. And this time, you know, complete silence. He rarely read about it anywhere. Um, I know I watch a very small amount of mainstream media, but I never see stories on it. And uh, it's very concerning. All right, that's what I'll wrap up for today. Hope everybody enjoyed the show. Online at libertarianinstitute.org, foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com, social media, Twitter at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E, Facebook is Libertarian Union, Minds is at Immersion News, of course, Immersion News is the name of my news site, subscribe to the show, rate and review it on the different podcatchers, and uh, keep tuned into the thing.